of the DCH Africa. And the DCH is the largest uh, HR organization in Europe and America. And this year, I have this great challenge of um, having this organization in Africa. And um, I'm very happy uh, because I found a lot of HR professionals in different countries. So in order to become more representative, we have uh, HR people from uh, Portuguese speaking countries, also from English speaking countries. And what we are going to do uh, from the next three years with the board of directors uh, that we have is uh, different activities in order to promote uh, some HR activities because we really want to have impact uh, in our countries and also in the continent, okay? So we have 13 countries and 20 HR people. And today is basically the first webinar and this year we are going to have two more webinars with different topics and different, not only the board of director members, but also with different HR specialists uh, from different countries. Uh, other activities that we are going to do is basically regarding uh, working with young people, uh, helping them in dissertations, also making some events for them. And beside of that, we are going also to have some executive lunch and breakfast uh, in each country in order to have the HR directors uh, discussing about uh, what we can improve and what we can do together to have you know uh, more solutions in terms of um, HR people. And um, this is our first webinar, as I mentioned, and we are going to have four uh, panelists in the next one hour. And we are going to have the debate from between them at 40 minutes. And after that, the 20 minutes will be for the public. You can make some questions and our moderator are going to make the questions for the panelists. So today we are going to have Senyu from Ghana and he will be in charge and moderating this panel. Tanya Markish uh, from Angola, uh, Wesley from Zambia and Thelma from Mozambique, but she's currently in Mauritius. <laughs> um, and um, uh, they will start now and Senyu will be moderating the panel. Thank you all. Senyu. Yes, thank you, um, Marlene, and welcome to everyone. Um, today we want to, in this webinar, discuss um, the topic, the challenges of managing people in crisis. And so um, I'm happy to be the moderator um, for the program. And so we'll just go straight into it. And then, um, so I can, I can, I can start asking the, the questions. So in terms of the, of, the, of the topic, we need to first understand what crisis is so that we can put all of that in perspective. So I will go first to Thelma. Thelma, um, what are some of the, uh, the scenarios in an organization that depict or describe what crisis is? So how do we know when we are in crisis. Yeah. Thank you. So um, a crisis is really an unexpected event or maybe a sequence of events um, that have enormous scale um, and they usually happen you know, quite quickly. There's an overwhelming speed. It creates a lot of uncertainty and it really can be um, disruptive to the operations, but actually it can put into question the viability of a business, right? So they tend to be low probability in that they don't happen so often, but when they do happen, um, they have um, enormous scale and significantly um, negative consequences. It can be reputational loss, can be financial loss, it can even be public safety. So um, crisis can be self-inflicted. So there can be something that happens within the organization that creates a crisis. Um, let's say, for example, there is an accident or an incident created by an employee in an environment that has hazardous chemicals. Um, there could be um, manipulation of accounting records, right? So again, it's, it's something that is happening within the organization that can create a crisis. Um, 
but they can also be um, due to external factors. So something like a natural disaster where you have um, a tsunami, a flood, um, that can create a crisis for an organization. Um, you can have um, a political movement, um, a terrorist attack. I mean, we've seen some of the situations that are happening, for example, in Nigeria, in northern Mozambique. These are examples of situations that, that are external to an organization, but can create a crisis, right? And so, of course, then we have um, COVID, which is also an external factor. It's a virus that has had um, significant um, impact, detrimental across governments um, and organizations um, across the globe. Great. Um, so, Wesley, uh, let me come to you. Are there any telltale signs that provide clues of um, impending or looming crisis? In, 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 in short, um, how do we recognize when um, crisis is coming? Is it, is it possible to be able to recognize um, and plan for, for crisis and see it coming? Yes, um, my, the answer is a yes. Uh, I'll give an example of um, a recession. Um, when a recession is about to happen, you know, you know, the, the, the economy, you know, begins to experience, you know, you know, certain uh, situations or certain factors of, uh, of the economy. So I'd like to you know, approach, you know, this question from, you know, uh, uh, a global uh, perspective. So there are certain signs, um, you know, I'll take, you know, re recession as an example of, you know, of a crisis. And what are the, you know, the telltale signs of, uh, of a recession which should, um, you know, organizations or governments should look out for uh, before, you know, in preparation or in trying to, to help uh, manage uh, a crisis. So when a recession, you know, is about to happen, you will see that uh, things like the consumers stop, uh, you know, start to lose confidence. Um, the economy mainly is driven by by the consumers. So this is why well, this is one of the signs of uh, that a crisis in in form of a recession is coming. Interest rates, you know, get weird, um, and then we see also that. Uh, you know, factories become quieter. You see that uh, the, the factories, they are the ones that are the engine of the economy. You see production slows down, uh, you know, and that gives you, you know, that's a sign, that's a total sign that really we, a crisis is coming uh, in form of, um, you know, in form of um, a, a recession. And also unemployment levels, um, you know, go up, they shoot higher, the rising unemployment is a sign of trouble for the economy. And that is, you know, that shows, you know, that, uh, you know, a, a, a crisis is coming uh, in form of, um, you know, a recession. And then we also see situations where, uh, you know, temporary employment, you know, becomes scarce. You know, uh, we we know that you know uh, not every economy can afford to give uh, its people permanent and pensionable employment. Uh, so this temp uh, employment becomes very scarce. Then you know that and that is a sign um, that you know a crisis is on its way um, in form of um, uh, a recession. And then we also see that workers stop. Um, you know, resigning, they stop calling it quits. You know, you, you see that people get stuck in, in organization and they can't move uh, from one organization to another because, you know, there's very little happening from the other organizations and other organizations can't take up uh, any more um, new employment. They can't create new opportunities uh, for, for employees. And then we also see from um, that things like the, the, you know, the sales of things like, you know, the new cars, you know, they, they, they go, they, they shift into a lower gear. People stop buying, 
you know, uh, you know, you know, in a, in a new cars because um, you know the you know car in in other in many places you find that a car is the the second biggest purchase from maybe a you know a property like like a home or a house. So that is also one sign that gives you uh, you know an indication that uh, a, a crisis is coming. And then stocks go on a losing path. Um, stocks fall hard as the economy, you know, uh, gets gets harder. Then we have also things like credit card debts and late payments rise. You know, this is an indication. Late credit card payments, you know, are a problem for the economy. When people are making a lot of purchases on their credits, that means they are spending. And as we you know, no consumer spending is great for the economy. So when there is a, you know, there is an issues with the late payments of the credit cards, that's also uh, an, an 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 indication. And then we see also inflation, you know, hits up. Okay, rising of inflation can trigger also a recession. That's a that's a that's a sign of a crisis that is coming when inflation goes higher. You know beyond the, the normal rates, then you know that we are headed uh, for, for, you know, for a crisis is coming. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So, so Tanya, um, how do we develop modalities to um, detect, predict, and forecast impending crises? And, and I'll, I'll put you a bit on the spot here because for COVID as a crisis, a global crisis, for example, we, we didn't see it coming. So how how do organizations prepare for this kind of um, just uh, surprises? Hi, um, good evening, everybody. As my uh, board colleagues um, have already mentioned, um, there are ways to to try to predict and to prepare for, for crisis. However, we have been living, and I will use the very cliche acronym in the VUCA world, um, which is um, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And this is the kind of environment that we have been living in for at least the past decade. Yes, we can use our efforts to um, to work on predicting, I have a little bit of a different opinion. I, my opinion is to be working on preparing ourselves for change and adapting. So as managers, as leaders, we have to have an approach of our certainty is change. And how we train our teams, how we focus, how we create goals, having this in mind that everything may and can and may change and we must adapt in accordance to the situation you said very well no one in the world ever expected to have covid and managing covid situation in already an uncertain continent which is africa we already have uh, other adjacent difficulties such as um, medical facilities um, um, apart from facilities, we also have medication, management, uh, hotel management, where to place our people in quarantine if we have um, positive cases, where we are going to allocate them since the government doesn't have enough facilities or adequate facilities. So we have all these uh, facing issues. Even within the COVID crisis, we still cannot predict what is going to be the next step because one period we are assuming that things are getting better and the line is going down and then look how europe is at, uh, at the moment there is a second wave which is much higher and people are thinking whether they are going to close down whether they are not going to close down so this is why i have the opinion and covid has taught us a lot and this is that digital information is here to stay and uh, we must train our people to be digital literate. We must manage in the, uh, manage distance. So we are throwing out the window that uh, being very strict on uh, timekeeping. We have to be managing on goals orientation, being managing um, communication. And like I said before, being able to adapt 
as it comes and you know teach resilience really i don't know if that answered the question yes sure sure uh thanks for 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 that answer um so so wesley um how did we miss how did the world miss you know um detecting COVID. What what did we do wrong? Despite the advancement um, of crisis management theory and practice, including you know advanced crisis and prevention technology, not to speak of um, religious prophecy and things like that. How 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 did we miss it? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I you know. I have a different approach uh, to, to, to this question where um, from, you know, the, the, you know, what has happened and looking at history, you know, we have history is important for, uh, you know, for it to help us prepare for the future. Uh, in my opinion, I'd say, you know, that the warnings of, of doctors and scientists were ignored uh, with uh, fatal results that which we are we are facing today. You know, I'd like to to quote you know the warnings of uh, you know Laurie Garrett, um, which he released to the world in 1994. Um, you know, named the coming plague. You know, um, Laurie said, um, while the human race battles itself, fighting over ever more crowded territory and the rare resources, the advantage moves to the microbes count. They are our predators and they will be victorious if we, the homo sapiens, do not learn how to live in a rational global village that affords the microbes few opportunities. Okay, so, you know, in a statement, you know, even if a statement, you know, somehow sounds exaggerated, there are other evidence we can consider to be more thoughtful analysis, like from the US Institute of Medicine. In 2004, uh, it evaluated the lessons of the 2003 you know, SARS outbreak, you know, out court, uh, quoting you know, the, you know, the words of, of Goyf who said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough we must do. It concluded that the rapid containment of SARS in a success, uh, is a success in a public health, but also a warning. If SARS reoccurs, health systems worldwide will be put under extreme pressure. Okay, so continued vigilance is vital. These, you know, these were the warnings, but then uh, the world did not take some of these warnings you know, you know, seriously, you know, I will also, you know, quote like, you know, Ian Boyd, a former chief scientific advisor to the UK government. Between 2012 and 2019, he recently remembered what left him traumatized up to the, today. He said a practice ran for an influenza pandemic in which about 200,000 people died, an experience which did not trigger government action. We learned what would help, but did not necessarily implement those lessons. Okay, so he said economy dampened the ambition and the commitment of relevant authorities to do what was right. Whatever the reasons for failing to act upon the lessons of SARS and influenza simulations, the question still remains unanswered. Okay, so we see that the global response to SARS COVID two is the greatest science policy failure in our generation. The signals were very clear, okay? We see that Hendra in 1994, there was Nipah in 1998, SARS in 2003, Maze in 2012, Ebola in 2014. These major human epidemics were all caused by viruses that originated in animal hosts and crossed over into humans. COVID-19 is caused by a new variant of the same, you know, coronavirus that caused SARS. To know that the warning signs went, you know, unheeded 
is, you know, is, 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 is a bit surprising. A good number of people have experienced a pandemic and the majority are guilty of ignoring information that doesn't reflect their own experience of the world. Catastrophes reveal the weakness of our human memory. So we see, you know, you know, uh, you know, how can one plan for a random event? Surely the, the sacrifices are too great. So we see that these, it's, it's, it's not that we, we you know, it's, it's a question of ignoring, you know, as a world, you know, we ignored, you know, these, you know, you know, these warnings. And this is why when COVID hit, you find that the world was confused. We were not prepared. You know, you know, the medical, you know, you know, fraternity was not prepared. Governments were not prepared. And now we know the world is overwhelmed. So I think in my opinion, you know, um, you know, it's not a question what caused what has put us in this situation? Today, we're asking a question, how did we fail? How did the world fail to see the coming of COVID? It was an issue of ignoring the you know, expert advice. Thank you. Great. So that's interesting, uh, Doctor. Um, there were the signs on the wall. Unfortunately, um, the world failed to and recognize it and basically ignored it. Let me quickly bring in a comment from one of our um, listeners and participants, Malufi Mohammed Sabru, who says that um, in terms of responding to or preparing for crisis, he says, I just would highlight the importance to put in place an emergency response plan as well as a crisis team. These will help quickly react to any issue that may occur. Um, and this, interestingly, I agree with that. But that brings me to um, our next question uh, for Telma. It, it seems a lot of organizations didn't um, look prepared, as we have said, with COVID, when, when COVID struck. Even the large corporates, surprisingly, didn't seem to um, be well prepared for, for COVID, which is, uh, for me, one of the greatest you know global crisis of our time um did crisis management and disaster recovery planning and processes did they fail did they fail because um i know some of these programs um we we attend these you know programs for certificates and you know courses and then they they charge so much and we spend a lot of organizations have spent a lot of money not only in training their people but actually um, putting processes and systems in place to have this happen. They've, they've um, employed you know, the services of very expensive consultants and all that. So how come it failed? Did it fail at all? Yeah, great question. And, and I want to just break up crisis management into perhaps three phases. You know, you have the pre-crisis when everything is starting to you know, come up and bubble up um, short amount of time. Then you have the crisis response, which is basically the moment that we're living in now because the pandemic is is not um, yet finished. I mean, we don't know. We're, we're having, um, as Tanya said, second waves in Europe. So we don't know when the end will be. And then you have post-crisis. So I don't want to say completely that crisis management has completely failed because we're still at crisis response time and things can still be actioned now because the end is not, we're not near the end. We don't even know when that will be. But it's important to recognize that there was a missed window, right? I think we've all alluded to that. Um, besides the cases years ago, um, there was a time in early January when the virus was already getting momentum in China. Right. So irrespective of, of SARS and all of those a couple of years ago, this particular virus was, was getting momentum in January. And there appeared to be very little response and preparedness. And I think a lot of corporations do have crisis management, uh, business continuity plans. I'm not sure that pandemics themselves are factored in. 
right? So a large disruption, if there's a fire, what do we do? Um, you know, if there's a situation, what do we do? But a pandemic, particularly one that has impacted global supply chain the way that this one has, I'm not sure that there was a preparedness. And I think, you know, a, a lot of what we're saying is there's a difference between understanding intellectually that there is a problem, there's a crisis that we need to think about scenarios and actually being prepared enacting, right, as a capability. Because people know we do the little certificates like you mentioned, what happens when there's a crisis, do we have emergency numbers? But when it actually happens, we don't know in a pandemic situation how our responses will be. Because when it's a moment of a lot of change, a lot of change creates a lot of uncertainty. A lot of uncertainty breeds fear and stress. And typically what happens in fear and stress is that we want to go back into our comfort zone. We want security. And a lot of our old playbook, you know, the stuff that we've done in the past is what we gravitate towards. But that is not what we need at this moment, right? Um, the predefined playbook plan is not what's going to get us to the next chapter. I mean, we've sp spoken about agility, and when we speak about managing people, because that's what we're talking about, managing people, first and foremost, we need to think about their safety and their well-being as a priority, right? We've spoken about resilience. Resilience is important because if we're talking about crisis management, business continuity, who is actually doing this work? It's the employees. Who is actually executing on these strategies? Who is prepared? Prepared to do what? To enable the organization to continue. So these are our employees. If they are not safe, if they don't have physical and mental well-being, um, if they are not resilient, um, these are all enablers that will allow business agility and will allow organizations to continue. So yes, there was a failure to address pandemics, but there's still an opportunity because this is far from over and this will not be the last pandemic. Great, that's nice. Um, thank you very much for all of, all of uh, your comments so far. Um, let me just um, announce to all participants that if you have questions, even as we continue to discuss these things, you can put them uh, in the chat column and then um, it will be compiled and then we're going to ask them to, or direct them to the uh, panelists. Uh, but the good thing about all this is, and the good news is that um, some organizations actually handled COVID quite well. Um, there were some success factors. The, some of the crisis responses were, were superb. Um, are there any lessons uh, to be learned, you know, in how some organizations handled, you know, the crisis? Tanya? Sorry, sorry, yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me ask the question. question. Yes, let me ask the question again. So the good news is that some organizations actually um, reacted very well uh, to the COVID crisis. Um, so there's some good news there. It wasn't all bad news for every organization. Yes, some organizations have gone down, but the good news is that a, a, a number of uh, organizations, you know, stood firm and were able to um, with, withstand, you know, the, the storms and the crisis that came. Are there any lessons we can learn from uh, some of these organizations that seem to have done well and survived the, the COVID crisis? Um, yes, like I was saying, it's, um, it's a very ambiguous question because what one deems crisis, what one company deems as a crisis, another uh, may deem as an opportunity. For example, uh, it can be a crisis for for um, for for a business in in uh, in restaurants, but it's an opportunity for the health for the health industry, for the for the medicines, for for private clinics, private doctors. So. Those, the companies who overcome crisis, first of all, it depends on what crisis it is. And second of all, before the crisis happened, 
the type of company it was, the type of culture the company had, the type of approach to crisis the company had, the type of management the company had. And management, it can be, it's not only um, HR management, it's, res it's other resources management, it's finance. It's their approach to this crisis uh, itself. So for a company to be um, overcoming a crisis, uh, depending on the crisis, it, it's very difficult to pinpoint unless you, you, you put out forward a specific example. The crisis that we're going through at the moment, even that is very ambiguous because it's being managed at different, at different scales, different levels, different ways, depending on the core business of the company, depending on the geographical location of the company. Because particularly for the one that, the one that we're going through at the moment, um, and Thelma had specifically said that uh, very well, we have internal factors and we have external factors. And right now we are facing both. We are facing limitations from the government, um, limitations of movement. For those who work in oil, oil and gas, we, we, and we must ensure business continuity, taking care of uh, visas and travel and allocating uh, places to have a quarantine and et cetera. We are still going through that and we are learning as we are going and we are adapting. So every hurdle, that we are going through at the moment and that we we overcome we use it as a lesson learned so at the moment overcoming this crisis and surviving it's too early to say who has survived and who hasn't because we are still facing a great deal of unpredictability and obviously we are we don't depend itself and even after COVID, we are still going to face a backlash of everything that's uh, been left hanging and, um, and on hold as well. So to, to be able to say, or to assume that the company, which company has or hasn't survived, it's very early to tell. And however, it all depends, like I said, it all depends on management. It all depends on the company culture. It all depends on the, approach that the employees had because the employees like Thelma said the staff our people these are the most valuable resources that we have and they will make it or break it during this time because it's with them that we can make it be successful or not successful during this crisis wonderful thank you very much um so you realize that we are still in the crisis. Um, we uh, received warnings of um, a second wave that is coming. All of a sudden, uh, even in the US, we are seeing um, new numbers soaring. Uh, even here in Ghana, we have seen a, 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 a slow you know, um, increase in the numbers, having managed to bring down the numbers. So it, it means that generally, until we are able to find you know, um, a solution to the virus, you know, um, it, it means that we still are in the thick and thin of it, and it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon so this question is to uh, any any of the panelists who uh, may want to uh, take a go at it so um the 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 crisis of covid you know has been let's say it has been more intense in some places than others and um, we, we we know that for example in africa it hasn't been that devastating um as compared to to the worst so some um of the organizations have handled it well some have not handled it well some organizations have you know a closed shop and, and and all that going forward how should organizations uh then write you know the tights and then um, live up to the challenges of COVID. you know in terms of for now and the future because um if there are any lessons learned at all at least now we've gotten you know close to maybe uh nine months to be able to do a, a good analysis uh business analysis of the crisis and and the situation and should be able to adapt 
quite well to be able to, you know, uh, return the business back to, you know, uh, winning weight. So going forward, how, how would you advise that uh, businesses should handle, you know, the, the crisis? Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Can I go for it before my, the other panelists come in? Uh, yes, you know, sure. yeah, for me, you know, COVID-19 has revealed the astonishing, you know, fragilities of our society. It has exposed, you know, our inability to cooperate, to coordinate, and to act together. But perhaps, you know, we can't control obviously the, the natural you know, uh, wild after all, we are not quite as dominant as we thought, you know, we are. You know, if COVID-19 eventually, you know, uh, you know, our continues, you know, uh, to attack uh, human beings, you know, I think this, these, the lessons um, you know, before even, you know, organization generally as, 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 as the world, the lessons that we have, we, have, we have learned, I think, should bring some humility in all the organization leaders, you know, government leaders, you know, uh, you know religious leaders in all the sectors of our community and our world. This should bring some form of humility, and then we must be able to to take, uh, you know, everything, you know, seriously. And because you know the the you know the advices which come, which experts, you know, give, you know, is something that is mainly, you know, uh, you know, come as a result of research, as a result of, you know, certain, you know. Uh, uh, advancement that you know, you know, we you know initially we talked about despite the advancement, but the the warnings and 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 also the 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 the, the disaster or, or the, the the damage which you know COVID has caused to to organization. I think that humility will be able to to help us going forward. Yes, Tama, anyone want to yeah. Yeah, I would just add that I think um, we really need to see inclusion as an enabler, as a, as a business enabler. Um, when you think about some of the organizations that have, um, I, I don't want to say success, they haven't had success, but they've better managed the situation. And you think about their culture, uh, what Tanya was talking about, it's, you see some of the progressiveness with the policies and the culture that they already adopted that had nothing to do with the pandemic, but that really enabled a smoother transition during this time. And I'll use a, a concrete example here. When I think of um, organizations that had flexible uh, parental leave, for example, they were already looking at providing employees with flex time, um, different work-life balance arrangements, but they were seeing that as an enabler that would enhance um, the culture and the well-being of their employees. And so with the pandemic, it actually allowed them to manage the situation a little bit smoother. Um, I think one of the, the audience members also mentioned something about a crisis management team, right? Again, when we think about inclusion as an enabler, think about the diversity of the individuals that are part of the crisis management team, right? And I'm talking about cognitive diversity. So if you're going to, again, lean on the old playbook, do things the way that you've always done, uh, address things with you know, your close unit, of trusted advisors that may not work anymore because it might be myopic and you might not see the full extent or even come up with solutions that will um, support all of the employee base, right? So for me, it's really inclusion as an enabler has been put on the spotlight um, for those companies that were better able to weather the storm. Great. Tanya, do you want to add anything? 
Um, yes, just to um, compliment on what um, Telmo was saying, I'm all up for, I'm very pro-inclusion. Um, and I, I see our employees as stakeholders in, in, in business success. And having the sense, having the, the feeling of inclusion and knowing what the vision and the goals are of the company and hiring employees to think and not just to do as they are told, this on its own, will make them feel included in the company, will make them feel like they are part of something. Uh, and not just, uh, and also to top up on this approach is to have, impl uh, have a company um, culture where we also promote multitasking, multi-faculties, and not where it's possible, obviously, there are areas where are very technical and specific, but, diverting people from just doing robotics uh, per se, robotic actions, have them be explored to the whole department when possible so that one employee can complement another one, especially in crisis, um, in crisis environment. Uh, we are now working at a maximum of 50% capacity in the office, and this is being put to the test and being put to practice where sharing knowledge and dividing dividing tasks, bringing the, the group together of work while the other ones are complementing from home and then swapping again. This is creating a sense of belonging. This is creating a sense and creating a community amongst the employees where there wasn't such. And the, yes, there are limitations here, um, many limitations, and one of them being uh, with, with technology, we have limited resources. Our internet is, uh, is very slow when there is internet. So resilience, I cannot stress enough resilience as the word here at the moment, the word of the hour, the word of this event, um, because people are going over and above from what they were. And, and, and it's surprising to me because having to manage people in distance during this uh, the, the, this environment, my my initial fear was that no, everyone is going to be home slacking. How are we going to manage this? And yes, having a crisis a crisis team um, is important. Yes, meeting frequently is important, but above all, is including all the employees in managing this situation and not just have it as me and them or us and them. That's all. Great, great, great. Uh, so thank you very much. And before we wrap up, and um, also while waiting for um, comments from comments and questions from uh, participants, uh, let me let me let me just uh, say this: that uh, experts have um, predicted that COVID would be just one of um, those crises that um, would begin, you know, or would be a window to, you know, other other crises, other perhaps, you know, um, crises, and um, to hit the world in the future. So going forward, what are some of the specific things with the hindsight of the challenges that COVID? Post to institutions, to employees, to business leaders, to boards of uh, directors and um, their businesses, and to countries, and indeed the whole global economy. With that hindsight, what are some of the specific things, the cogent things that organizations should do, not can do, should do as a necessity in preparation for similar crisis uh, in the future, using um, the COVID crisis as a reference? Anyone well, can take it. Tell me you want to start, yeah. I'll start. Again, I am all about um, the human experience, right, in any crisis. So I would start off with, first off, protect mental and physical well-being right because mm -hmm. 
You don't want to wait until people are burnt out. All of the examples that Tanya mentioned, right? You want to do that before because what is certain, at least in, in my perspective, is, is that there will be other crises, epidemics, pandemics, political movements, whatever it may be. And the sheer fact that we are so interconnected now is that something that happens in a far distance can come back um, and have ripple effect in other parts of the world, right? Um, and it may not be a virus, but it could be as well. So if we start with building that resiliency, I, I'm, I'm all for it as well, Tanya. Protect mental and physical well-being because then your staff will be ready. They will have a sense of belonging. They will have motivation. They will be um, engaged. And so whatever change scenario that comes their way, uh, they'll be better able to handle. So for me, that would be number one, because I think it's not to say that there hasn't been thought about well-being. I just don't think it has been intentional. I think there's been a bit of lip service and we're doing some things, but we're not thinking about well-being in its fullness um, and how we can really build this and make it be an enabler for the business. I, I think this is the part that that um, would need to be strategized instead of it just being sort of a once-off exercise. Great, Leslie. Yeah, I think just to to add on on what uh, you know, Thelma's, um, you know, what she has what she has said. I think um, we need to, you know, to prepare the workforce, you know, for the um the the future because the pandemic has changed a lot of things uh when it comes to skills yeah not all employees will be able to do what they used to do uh in the past so for organizations leaders you know directors i think we you know there must be a deliberate move to invest in to try to you know give you know new skills and also enhance the skills to the to the workforce so that you know we can you know they they can enhance their confidence and their 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 trust and also to be able to 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 invest in in um, you know you know you know sensitizing the workforce you know you find that there are different levels of of employees in any organization. So there is a duty to ensure that information must flow, you know, correct information must flow to the last, uh, up to the bottom, from top to the bottom to ensure that every employee has the right information about what is happening now and also what might happen next. So that everyone how, you know, if everyone's confidence is restored and everyone knows that if we work together, if we put our, our hands together, we follow the advice and, 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 and do the right things, we will be able to, 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 to survive what is happening today and what might happen in the future. So I think the issue of, you know, imparting um, um, new skills, be because we've seen that, you know, uh, it in in the past, the the, the you know the, the flexibilization by many organization was 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 a big issue, but when the COVID came and hit hard, you know, you you discovered that in you know, organizations had no option but they had to to be flexible. They had to allow certain employees to work from home. They had to allow you know people to do certain things online. And the certain things that they used to insist to, to be done physically today is, is acceptable and, and organizations are, um, are, are slowly changing. I know change can be difficult, but the advice is that we need to uh, face these issues uh, and, and ensure that we, we move very fast and, and, and ensure that uh, they, 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 as we manage uh, the workforce during 
this period and even in the future, in the near future, it may not be too long uh, before we 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 are we we are hit or be or you know as the the COVID you know pandemic continues. So we need to make sure that we prepare to survive going forward and also to ensure that because it's about the workforce, it's about people. No matter how technologically prepared an organization can be, if the people are not prepared, like what Thelma said about, you know, you know, mentally, you know, physically, if everyone is saying, no, look, if I go for work, if I go back for work, uh, you know, you know, I might die. The people have seen deaths that they've never seen before. Uh, people are traumatized. Uh, people have lost, you know, you know, family members, friends, and and also to talk about the 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 the, the medical uh, fraternity, the medical fraternity. They've confessed they've never seen this kind of deaths. They've also been, you know, overwhelmed. What are we doing about? The, our doctors, our nurses, our medical staff, are, are we investing enough in them to strengthen them, to encourage them and continue doing what they are doing even to do um, you know, better? So for, right. for, for me, it's, it's something that we need to make sure it's about the focus must be about the people. When we prepare the people, then the organizations will survive. Great, great, great. We um, are fast approaching uh, the end of the um, webinar, but um, just to give an opportunity to Tamia, if you have anything to add to um, what uh, the, the question on the floor, Zuba. Yes. Um, we have been discussing the, the, the pandemic and whether we could predict it or we couldn't whether we were prepared or we weren't. I think, I believe that the crisis at the moment that we are facing is not the pandemic itself. It's the environment surrounding the pandemic. We have had many pandemics in the past, ep epidemics in the past that were highly deadly, much more deadlier than, than, than uh, SARS-CoV-2. And never in the world history, has the world shut down. So I believe that the approach to managing this, yes, it's highly, it's highly uh, contagious, but it's 4% of death rate. We are right. in Africa. Uh, it, it has been said and argued that the Afri in Africa, we have not been uh, so badly hit. We have been highly hit in Africa. We have been highly hit with um, inflation with other restrictions of um, restriction in, in, in uh, outside investments. So the crisis here, really, that we are managing, it's not one crisis, it's many crises in one go. Because not at any one point in time, anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world, is a company or a country not facing any sort of problems or issues or setbacks. Okay, we are used to having setbacks and problems and some sort of crisis. What is happening at the moment is a compilation of various crises that are happening and is affecting, is creating a domino effect that is surrounding the COVID. COVID itself is not the crisis. Looking forward, yes, we have to, we can, up until now, there has been nine months, well, more than nine months. I think it started in October last year. And yes, there has been trends. And we, there was all, always conflicting information and opinions, whether we should have done that, whether we should have not done that. Some countries have taken the approach of full lockdown and their cases are still rising. Other countries were a little bit more flexible and not uh, had um, such strict rules. And, they, and their cases are not so bad. So this has been a trial and error and still is being a trial and error. Yes, each hurdle, as I said, that we are going through, we can manage, we can uh, recollect, regroup, evaluate and see the lessons learned and look at the possibilities of a way forward. For okay. the future, okay. we, know that, we know that technology is here to stay. We know that we must make the best use of it. 
Um, training, yes, training we, uh, must be provided, but it's only effective if people can take good use of this training. It's not just giving training to saying giving training. Giving training is a, almost a science on itself, is to evaluate what the person is supposed to do, what the person knows how to do it, and evaluate the difference. It's not just providing training here and there. Okay. And uh, okay. I'll, 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 I don't want to go on. I'll just, uh, otherwise, okay. I'll start another okay. lecture on it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Tamia. So um, before I, I come back to you for your closing remarks, uh, which will just be uh, 30, 30 seconds remarks, um, Carlos. Betan Court, I hope I, I mentioned it right, uh, says that I would like to say that basic health and financial education is a must have in order to support each individual in society deal with life and in this case, this crisis. Organizations can support in this effort as part of development programs they may have. So uh, thank you very much for that comment, um, Carlos. Um, Britain court. So, um, closing out, any closing comments uh, in terms of um, advice for organizations um, in general and uh, organizational leaders? Uh, what would be your closing remarks? Good luck. Anyone? Maybe Tanya should <laughs> finish first. 30, 30 seconds. <coughs> Well, my, my, I don't have any specific um, closing remarks. I mean, like I said, this is still ongoing. Hoping to have this webinar maybe in another six months and we evaluate where we're standing, and where we are coming from. But just keep at it. Don't uh, try not to be as impulsive. Try to take it as it goes. Get advice, listen. Don't be afraid to stop and to evaluate. Always evaluate the various possibilities without making a decision because whatever decision you okay. make at the moment is going to have some sort of if a bad effect and, okay. and, and a good effect. Okay, okay, thank you, Tanya. Um, Thelma? Okay. Just to build on that business agility. Agility is key now because there's way too many external factors that are changing all the time that are out of control. So uh, agility is key. And just to re-emphasize, um, inclusion, diversity and inclusion as an enabler for that business agility. Great, thank you. Wesley? Yeah, I think um, it's uh, also to, um, to take expert advice seriously and also not to ignore everything. We need to take everything seriously. We, there are lessons that have been learned um, and, 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 and the, 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 the key issue is to to make sure that people survive, we protect the, the people, and once the people know that they are protected, then we instill confidence and they'll be able to come forward, and then we will be able to, to manage to go through the, the pandemic. Great, thank you very much. We are out of time. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Wesley Chikwanda, Head of uh, Human Resources, Kagam Mining Limited and Gemfields Group of Companies in Zambia. We have, um, thank you also to Tanya Marquez or Max. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Tanya okay. Ma Marquez, HR Manager, Oil and Gas Sector in Angola, and then our own Thelma Leguen, um, Regional Total Rewards Manager, speaking out of Mauritius. My name again is Senyo Emma Jabing. I, I have been your moderator and um, speaking out of Ghana. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. My final comments will be that organizations that prepare are organizations that survive. Thank you so much. Let's keep the conversation going and we hope that like um, Tanya said in six months we can come back and reevaluate and see where we are. Thank you all for uh, uh, participating and thank you for everything. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Senor.